Hello, folks. This is Standard 2A, and we're going to talk about the beginning of westward expansion. And before we get to that, let's just take a minute and refresh our memories where we are and where we're going. So <clears throat> the United States is coming out of the War of 1812. Uh, President Jefferson had just purchased the Louisiana Territory. The United States is focusing now not on Britain. We have this new national identity. We're entering into the era of good feet. Everyone's kind of pushing in the same direction. We're all excited after uh, the War of 1812. So the United States is facing westward now. We're going to start this idea of westward expansion. We're moving across the Appalachian Mountains, across the Mississippi River, and into the west. And it's important to remember that. And it's important to think about how people are getting there. We're going to talk about a few different revolutions. One is a market revolution. And if you remember back to uh, Mr. Chapel's class, uh, the market is... Uh, not like a supermarket, but it's a, a place where people buy and sell and trade goods. In this case, we're talking about the emergence of a, a national marketplace. And that is going to go along with several other revolutions, most notably a transportation revolution. We have this market revolution and capitalism growing. And in the 19th century, more farm families are engaged in what we're going to call commercial agriculture. They're able to now produce surplus, which they can sell in the marketplace. But farm goods spoil, and they spoil rather quickly. So they got to be able to flow around the country pretty quickly. And that's going to lead to these new internal improvements that are going to help move people and goods around faster. Uh, better roads, better bridges. These are important things. They're pretty common. Uh, more importantly, as you can see here, new water transportation. The United States now has control of the entire Mississippi River, and they're going to develop these steamboats, these paddle boats that are driven by steam engines. They're going to connect rivers together through canals and other bodies of water through canals. And eventually we're going to get railroads. This is uh, one of our first uh, early transportation maps. You can see that uh, this is 1840. Uh, these red lines are roads, people moving into the west. Notice it's east-west, not north-south. Uh, canals, we're going to look at the Erie Canal right here in one minute, connecting New York to the Great Lakes and all the way over here through Chicago into the Mississippi River down this way. So all of these are gonna be important ways to get people moving around the country and get the country facing westward. Now let's take a look at the Erie Canal. The canal is gonna connect New York City to the raw materials of the Midwest. And why is this important? Because it's gonna allow all of those wonderful raw materials from the West to flow into New York City. New York City is going to then turn that into trade and profit. And the important thing here is that farmers in the West have easy access to markets in the East. Why does that matter? Well, when you can move out to the West and make money, more people are going to move into the West where there's a lot of cheap available land. Uh, well, the government's going to have a part in that. We'll talk about that later. But they're going to get the Native Americans off of that territory. And uh, the white settlers want that land. They're going to move into the West. And uh, the government's going to play a big role in helping with that. How important is the Erie Canal? Well, it turns New York City into the biggest city in the country. By 1860, it has over a million people living there, and it is economically the most important city in the United States. Canals have a short lifespan. Uh, they emerge in the 1820s, but by the 1850s, there's railroads that are cheaper, faster, and more versatile than canals. A canal was basically a big ditch, and you had to have horses pull your stuff along the canal. So you moved at the speed of a horse. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, railroads can run all day, all night. 10, 15 miles an hour, all day, all night. Which doesn't seem like it's very fast now, but at the time, it was revolutionary. These railroads are going to spread like just weeds throughout the north and the west especially and it's going to incur encourage western settlement and expansion of that agriculture especially in the north and the west the southerners are still engaged in cash crops in the south uh, but they have those deep navigable rivers we talked about before so they don't need these transportation systems as much and you'll notice right above my head here that uh, most of the railroad construction and canal construction was up in the north, connecting the north to the west. Not a whole lot in the south, there's some, but not a lot. And that's gonna have a lot of huge impacts later on. In addition to faster transportation, there's a revolution in communications. 
mostly through the telegraph. This is going to speed up long distance communications, and this is going to help improve the market as well, especially on, on Wall Street, because in the stock market, knowledge is power. So if you know that uh, apples are selling for a dollar in one area, but two dollars somewhere else, you can uh, adjust your own pricing based on that communication. This is also going to help railroad operators schedule their trains so there's less crashes and things can move even faster. So the national marketplace is growing through these transportation revolutions, the communication revolutions, and we have a national marketplace. I think I've said that enough. I think that that's something that you probably want to write down. A national marketplace is going, people growing uh, and moving around the country faster and faster. Okay, this guy's really important. His name's Henry Clay. He's sometimes called the great negotiator. He is going to settle several different compromises. But before we get to the compromises, you need to understand he's responsible for something referred to as the American system. The American system was an intense focus on the American economy, so intense people sometimes call it economic nationalism, right? Putting the country's economic needs before all else. He's trying to protect American industries, and he's doing this in three ways. One, he wants uh, to protect industries by having a federal tariff. That's the last one on this list, but a tariff is designed to increase the price of foreign goods. When you increase, it's a tax on goods coming into the country. And when you tax those foreign products, it makes them more expensive, which means people are going to, um, Americans who are more frugal, are going to want to buy the cheaper product, which is the American product, even if it's not quite as good a co uh, quality. So Americans will buy American goods. Well, they need to be able to store all the revenues from this new tariff, which is a new tax. And they're going to, uh, Clay wants to create a national bank. This is a little controversial at the time. Many people were afraid that a bank would be a tool just of the wealthy, but he wants a bank to store the revenue and to control the money supply and make sure that there's no big swings. He's going to get that. The last thing he wants to do is increase and uh, better promote the internal improvements, meaning the transportation system around the country. So he's going to use that money that's in the bank to build new roads and new bridges and new canals, and especially and most importantly, new railroads. All of those internal improvements are going to be funded by the tariff, the bank, and they're going to work together in order to uh, create this American system. Now, the North and the South disagree about this. The North wants the railroads. The South doesn't. The South is still in that um, cotton-based cash crop system which means they don't need to have all of these internal improvements. It means they don't have manufacturing, which means they don't need the tariff. They don't trust the bank because as farmers, they, don't, um, they want cheap land and they think banks are gonna take advantage of that. So the South doesn't agree with most of this stuff. Uh, fortunately for Clay, Westerners do. So the North and the West are gonna work together in order to get the Clay, uh, Clay's American system passed. Now, um, some will argue that cotton, uh, that um, that slavery was kind of dying out at the time of the American Revolution, and maybe it was, but that doesn't really matter because in 1794, Eli Whitney develops the cotton gin. Gin is short for engine, and what the cotton gin does is make it easier for seeds to be taken out of cotton. Cotton had been a luxury good, something that only the very wealthy could get before this time. But now with the cotton gin, you can produce cotton more easily. Ironically, unfortunately, this leads to a higher demand for cotton, which means they wanted a higher demand for production. And what that means is that the number of enslaved people in the United States is going to rise equally with the development of cotton. So this green bar is cotton. You can see the rise in enslaved peoples is right along with it. It was so important that they referred to cotton as king cotton. And it's going to lead to an expansion of slavery. As slavery increased, cotton production increased, and vice versa. This is mostly going to be concentrated in the lower south. Now, what that means is that um, we have the deep south, South Carolina, and kind of along the Gulf Coast, there's going to be the major areas of cotton production. There's still enslavement in what we're going to call kind of that upper southern region, uh, but it's not going to be as prevalent. There's going to be less percentage, but still quite important.
Cotton is going to fuel a growing manufacturing industry in the north. The northern industries are going to benefit from cheap cotton in the southern plantations. There's no way around this. Uh, everybody's involved in this. While the northerners didn't uh, directly enslave people, they benefited from that cheap cotton. And I think something like two thirds of all the cotton yield is going to go to the northern manufacturers. There's going to be a shift from water wheel to coal and steam engines, which is going to increase the amount of production. And the mill owners are going to ask for that tariff, which is part of the American system. And then they're going to use the railroads that are part of the American system to get those cheap raw materials from the south up into the north, transport finished products back and forth more quickly, and we get the national marketplace. And remember, it's all made possible by the steam engine, the railroads, the steamboats, sorry, typo, uh, created by the national market, the cotton gin, which is powered by steam power. Um, all of this is made by uh, the steam engine. Wow, there's a couple of typos on there. Sorry. Interestingly, the first people that were employed in these uh, mills, the first model was known as the, the Lowell Mill model. Uh, and mostly it was young unmarried women that would work in the factories. Uh, you see, didn't have a lot, didn't need to have a lot of muscle power in order to work these machines. So uh, with the, the steam power and with the development of machinery, women and, and even younger people could work uh, the, in the factories. Initially, it was a way that uh, these young women saw as a way to escape the farm. Um, they could get away from the prying eyes of their, their, their overprotective parents. Uh, they could go off and find a husband uh, without their parents uh, getting involved. Um, and initially for the first year or two, it, it seemed great. Uh, but after a very short amount of time, um, these factories proved to be dirty and dangerous and uh, the owners tried to become more and more controlling. And there were uh, strikes and conflicts between the labor and the management. So um, it does become sort of an early example of the labor movement becoming uh, in development. Uh, cities and industrialization tend to go together. Uh, rural villages that had developed these early factories became grimy industrial cities. Um, there's gonna be competition for jobs and wages Immigrate, uh, immigrants are going to become an important part of uh, the factory machinery. Um, native born workers are going to be opposed to immigrants because they thought that they drove the wages down through more competition. And that's gonna lead to early labor unions as well. Speaking of immigration, uh, between 1845 and 1854, the United States had the greatest influx of immigrants in U.S. history. About 15% of the total population uh, were immigrants. And we're going to refer to them as old immigrants, not because of their age, but because they're the first immigrants. That implies that there's going to be new immigrants. Uh, so these old immigrants were from Ireland and Germany. And we're going to talk about old immigrants all the way up until like the 1880s or so, when the new immigrants that are coming from new places are going to arrive. Um, so these Irish and the Germans are going to come, they're going to work in the city, in the textile factories. Um, they're going to not be liked at all prior to, uh, say, the Civil War. They're going to be seen as un-American. Uh, but the industrial economy needed workers, and that's why the United States really allowed pretty open immigration. There's a lot of nativism. So you can see here, this is an Irish whiskey barrel, and this is a German beer barrel, and they're running off with the ballot box, right? Because these are not real Americans, but they're voting in such large numbers that these uh, ignorant immigrants are stealing our way of life. That's what a nativist would say uh, during that time period. So let's quickly talk about the Irish. Many Irish were fleeing because of the Irish potato famine. Um, they settled in cities. They tended to be pretty poor because they are coming from that famine. Uh, there were others not just leaving because they had to, because they wanted to. Uh, the tenements, which is what these places are called, were crowded, filthy areas full of crime and disease and uh, fire. And um, it was just generally poor. Uh, eventually, after a generation or two, most of the families were able to leave. Uh, and they were competing with uh, free African-American uh, workers for low-wage, unskilled, low wage, unskilled jobs. Um, so that's going to lead to quite a bit of racism. Uh, a lot of conflict between these Irish folks and the African-American folks. In contrast to the Irish, the Germans came over, they tended to be a little bit more well off and they could move away from the city. They're the second largest group of immigrants at the time and they tended to be craftspeople and a little bit more well-educated. They tended to be Protestant, whereas the Irish were Catholic and the Catholics were not seen as American either because they thought that their loyalty would be with the Pope. 
Now, when the Germans came over, they moved to rural areas. They tended to move into the community and they settled there and became staples. So they're a little bit more easily assimilated, although the Irish are going to assimilate around the time of the um, Civil War. There is a group prior to the Civil War that emerges called the Know Nothings, called that because they were told that they were, if anybody asked what they believed, they were saying, I know nothing. Um, these groups of know-nothings were nativists. They didn't like Irish, they didn't like the Germans, and they tended to target immigrants and Catholics to try to get them to leave. Now this cartoon is showing the Pope, and in turn, this is Irish immigrants um, coming to the shores, trying to take over our country. And there's a good young person saying, oh no, you must read the actual Bible. Now, today we think of Catholics as Christian, but they were discriminated against as sort of unchristian, un-American. And here's Uncle Sam whittling something, getting ready for a fight. It's after the War of 1812 that the United States implements a new policy called the Monroe Doctrine, uh, named after President Monroe. Now, when you see doctrine, that usually means whatever the president's uh, position is in foreign policy. So the Monroe Doctrine is the doctrine the, the, the policies that were in place dealing with foreign countries under his administration. And what the Monroe Doctrine means is simply that the United States didn't want any more European colonization in Latin America. Why? Because the Americans wanted to colonize there. You can see here in this cartoon that Uncle Sam, stands for the United States, has thrown his hat on Latin America. The hat's covering Latin America, which means he's claiming Latin America. Now, the United States didn't have any power to enforce this, so the British lent their navy for the United States to enforce it. <coughs> Excuse me. Because the British were hoping that nobody else would colonize there either because they had a bunch of uh, trade that was going on in that area. And there's colonies that owed them debts. So the United States is going to tell the Europeans to stay out of Latin America and the Western Hemisphere. You can see that map says Western Hemisphere. The Europeans need to stay out of the Western Hemisphere, and in return, the United States will stay out of European affairs. That's the Monroe Doctrine. We won't get involved in Europe as long as the Europeans stay out of our business. That is going to impact many things going all the way up to World War I and II, where the United States really tries to stay out of European affairs uh, altogether. Last thing, uh, the Louisiana Purchase. Now, the United States is going to uh, purchase Louisiana. We talked about this in the last unit, and it's going to double the size of the United States and it refocuses the United States towards the West. Now remember, Jefferson violated his strict interpretation of the Constitution to do this. It doesn't say anywhere in the Constitution that presidents can purchase land, which means he loosely interpreted it, which is kind of funny. Politicians, I guess, are hypocritical. But what this is gonna do is make the United States have to think about slavery. Because what ends up happening is that as people moved into the West, they wanted, sorry, my face just disappeared. Uh, they wanted to settle and continue the style of agriculture that they had been a part of. So Northerners tended to move to the North and they wanted to be small family farms. And in the South, well, they wanted to extend slavery into the South because they wanted to grow cotton and they wanted to continue their way of life. So there has to be some sort of a, a settlement, a compromise, because of the sectional conflict was just too much. So the politicians decide that they're going to kind of put up a barrier between the North and the South as the, the country expands to the West. Because remember, Manifest Destiny says the United States is going to get all the way over to the Pacific Coast. So you have free soilers who don't want enslavement in their territory. We'll talk about that more later. And you have in, uh, the enslaver population down here that wants to continue slavery. So they come to a compromise that applies only to the Louisiana Purchase Territory. Remember, this isn't the United States yet, only for this middle chunk. And the compromise they come up with is they say Missouri, this area right here, had applied to become a slave state. So it can become a slave state. But they wanted to maintain the balance of power in the Senate because they wanted an equal number of free soil states and slave states. So Missouri comes in as a slave state. Maine, which had been part of Massachusetts, will be allowed to enter the Union as a free soil state, so it maintains the balance. But they want to settle this issue for the future so they don't have to fight about it again. And they draw a line right here, the 3630 line. And they say at that line, everything above it will be free soil and everything below it is slavery based. Now think about what's happening here. 
it looks like the North is getting the better deal, but it's actually not because the organized territory up here was seen as kind of the great American desert. There wasn't really a great way to settle here with the technology of the time. And the assumption was the United States is getting to the Pacific Ocean. So if you draw that line out, it's actually a much more equal deal than it looks. So there you go. We'll pick up with this next time.